If you would, take out your, uh, your Bibles and turn to page 152, if you're using the Pew Bible, 152. And for those of you who aren't, it's Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8. This is the uh, text from which the sermon is taken. Uh, we'll read it, pray, and, um, and we'll worship over uh, this, this text together. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. For you are a people, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. From the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This is God's word. Let's pray. God, we come now and we bow our hearts and our knees and our minds before you. From whom every family on this earth is named. And we ask that you might... Strengthen us according to your spirit in our inner person that we might have the ability to comprehend the height and depth and breadth and width to know your love that surpasses knowledge that we might be filled with your fullness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the demonstration of it, for sending Jesus to die for us. For you so loved the world that you gave your only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we thank you for the demonstration of your love and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And we ask now, Lord, that as we look at this love, a love that's completely alien to us, foreign to us, outside of us, that you would hold us in all of it. Help us to... Here, give us soft hearts that's, that are able to receive the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. And I pray, God, that you would give me a single-minded focus to glorify and to make much of you. I need your help, Lord, as I preach. Holy Spirit, come. Have your way with me. Make God's Christ's way known among us and do it all for the glory of the name of our risen King. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So this, is, this sermon series is entitled An Unexpected Advent. And it's unexpected, um, not in the sense that the Jewish people weren't looking for their Messiah. That's not what I mean when I say an unexpected advent. Advent means coming. It's unexpected in the way that he comes. And so we've lit these Advent candles, one for hope and one for love. And last week we talked about an unexpected hope, how biblical hope, hope that's saturated with and focused on the person of Jesus Christ, always rises in unexpected places. Today we're going to talk about unexpected love. There's something about the love of God that we see in the person of Jesus Christ that is unexpected to us. If I were to ask you, or if I were to tell you, rather, that God loves you, if I were to come up to you and say, Jesus Christ loves you so much, you know God loves you, he loves you so much, how would you describe that love to me? What does that mean to you? It really depends on your notion of love, and how you've experienced love how you've received love, and how you've loved someone else. People process God loves me through a thousand different philosophical worldviews, experiences, presuppositions, and beliefs. And so it's really hard to get to the point of what it means for God to love us. A great example of this is in the book of Ephesians chapter 3. I quoted it in my prayer just now. Paul prays. Concerning Christians, this is his prayer in Ephesians 3. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but 
I'm going to read it. Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 19. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's fascinating. These people are Christians. They're not unbelievers. They're Christians. And Paul's prayer for them is that they would come to know God's love even more than they already know it. That's that's Paul's prayer. Not that we just get all deep into the things that divide religions today, right? And we can mention a ton of them. But that we as Christians would go deeper in what it means for God to love us. If Christians have a hard time understanding what it means for God to love them, what do you think unbelievers, how do you think they feel? If we can't comprehend it, they sure can't. And that's what the world needs to know. Ultimately, that God loves them. One of the reasons that it's very difficult for us to understand God's love, as I've just stated, is because... Our notion of love is much different than God's notion of love. The way we experience love and receive it and give it is different than the way God gives it. So somebody might say, I can't believe that God would love someone like me. God can't love me. I don't even like him. That statement reveals that they are processing God's love for them through their own lens through which they love other people. God can't love me because I can't conceive of a God who would love somebody like me. In other words, I am the judge of who is worthy of being loved. And that's the problem we run into. The reason I've chosen Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8 as the text for this, this sermon, Unexpected Love, is because it does a couple of things. First and foremost, it shows us the way we love, our notion of love. It reveals our notion of love. And then, right after that, it reveals God's notion of love, the way God loves, and it's completely different than the way we love. So let's just start in verse 6 of Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8, probably won't be a very long sermon. It's not a very long text, but hopefully it'll get to the point and we'll understand it. This is, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, probably... I'm sorry, verse 7, Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. Probably the most succinct description of worldly love that exists. Verse 7. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. Stop right there. This text reveals a deep inclination and a propensity of the human heart. To love things and people and places that are great. We love great things. That's why we say things like, this piece of clothing is not very flattering. Right? Right? We love people that look good, or that are smart, or that are wealthy, or that speak well. Whatever measure of greatness you want to put on something, that more often than not is the very first thing that inclines us to whatever we're going to set our love on. I bet not one of you in this building married who a person you thought was just ugly. They're so ugly, but they're nice. We love great things, great things, beautiful people, big checking accounts, big, completely funded retirement accounts. 
And what God's telling Israel here through Moses is that this inclination exists in you. You will think that I love you because of something in yourself that endears yourself to me. Some greatness that's in you. Some potential that's in you. You will think that way, but don't. One of the reasons that we love great things, if you want to get psychological, is because greatness minimizes in our minds the risk of loss or being hurt by what we love. If we love something great, it's less likely to hurt us than us loving something that's not so great. Because love is risky. It puts itself out there. And if somebody can meet all my conditions before I give them my love, then my heart is much more secure than it would otherwise be. This person has less of a chance of hurting me than this person does. This is why love is blind. You ever heard of that old adage? Love is blind. When an adage like that exists for hundreds of years, you know why it exists? Because it's true. And love has to be blind for us as sinners. If our love were not blind, we wouldn't love at all. We just wouldn't. If you could see all of your spouse's imperfections or all of my imperfections, you wouldn't love me because I would hurt you. And so would they. And so would he. And so would it. So love has to be blind or we wouldn't love at all. That's why, kind of off base here, but that's why your love grows when you mature in Christ's likeness. That's why God allows you to be attracted to somebody and say, man, they are hot. I'm going to marry them. And then you get married, and he unfolds their imperfections over time. Because if he were to show you everything you needed to know about that person before you married them, you wouldn't marry them. You just wouldn't. It has to be that way. The longer you're in a relationship with somebody, the more your love for them mirrors or should mirror Christ's love for you. That's the way it works. That's how we grow. It minimizes the risk of loss or being hurt. And if you love something great, here it goes. It maximizes the probability of your joy. Because this is the way we love intrinsically. We don't love to give someone something. We love to get something from someone. Some kind of gratification, some kind of status, some kind of security. That's the way most of our love begins. In the wrong place. We love to get something. And you're not going to get anything from the lowest of low. What incentive do you have to love them? If you're just a worldly person like we all are. I'm not going to loan them any money. They can't pay me back. A small nation can't give like a big nation. And if you don't think that we love this way, just listen to the way we talk. The language that we use in marriage is a language of concession. I'm not going to be able to have my Lord of the Rings room with all my movie replica swords and action figures and posters that I've framed when I get married because she wants to decorate the house a certain way. I have to give that up because marriage, after all, is a compromise. People that speak in language of compromise are people whose heart is set on the getting what they want. Well, I can't have what I want. I can't have my Alabama room. I don't know why she doesn't feel like that these Daniel Moore pictures are beautiful in our living room. They're gorgeous. This is the way we talk. Because this is the way we are. Our way. And so we get married and then hang our head. 
and concede every fun thing that brought us joy in our life is now dead. And we just move on with life. I mean, this is, this is the way the world loves, all right? This is the way we love, and it's imperfect. We're just imperfect people. But when you look at the way God loves, it is immediately different. Ready? Let's go to verse, the last part of verse 7, Deuteronomy 7. He reminds them, it's not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on, all the, on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. I'm going to, I messed that up. Let's start all over. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. So God didn't love you for your greatness, comma, for, this is why he, this is, this is going to give an insight as to why he loves them. For you were the fewest of all peoples. This little clause right here tells us a lot about God's love. And the main things it tells us about God's love is this. We love greatness as humans. We love the highest of high, but God loves the lowest of low. You weren't great. You were the fewest of all peoples, not smaller than most, the fewest of all, dead last. So the committee has been meeting, the college football's committee's meeting to decide who they're going to set their love on, Ohio State or Alabama. And if God were in that committee room, he'd say, what are you all talking about? I'm going with Charlotte. Oh, and 12, Charlotte. That's my pick. That's what we love greatness. Give me big names, big sources of incomes, big talent, big winning records. And God says, I'll take Charlotte, haven't won a game. Oh, and 12. And what makes the gospel so offensive? is this, we fancy ourselves Alabama, or Ohio State, or Clemson, or Auburn, or something that's tied with greatness, and we're all Charlottes. That's what the gospel says. You're all Charlottes. You're not undefeated. You don't have a win. You're 0-12. You're not on anybody's mind on this committee, but God's. That's it. And I get this from Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7. And we're not going to get to who we are for a minute. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. That's not us. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare to even to die. That's not us. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Owen 12, Charlotte. We love greatness. God loves those who are Condensated, if that's even a word. If it hasn't, I made it up. Which means, God loving the lowest of low means that there's absolutely no probability of joy for him when he sets his love on us. There's no mitigation of risk when he sets his love on us. He is sure to get hurt. He gets killed. God loves in order to give, not in order to receive. That is what is so unexpected about this love. Is that it throws all the things that we think that are important about love and self-preservation in loving someone else out the window and it says, I'll give myself to you when no one else wants you. 
I open myself to you even though you will hurt me. I will take the possibility of zero joy by loving you because you will fail me. But I won't fail you. God loves us when we are at our lowest. When we're angry at him, when we question whether or not he exists, when we don't obey, when we don't listen, when we were out doing God knows what, with God knows who, that's when he loved us. Not when you were here and partaking communion like you were something. That's what we do. Just play. Play righteous. He didn't love you while the, while the, when, the, when the mask finally comes off. He loves you when the mask is on. And here's why he loves you. Verse 8, Deuteronomy 7. Back to the other end of the Bible. I should have bookmarked it. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of people. Here's the reason why he loves them. But it is because the Lord loves you. Why does God love you? The biblical answer is because he feels like it. That's what it means when it says, it is because the Lord loves you that he loves you. God, why do you love me? Because I do. Which means this. When you have a God who sets his love on you for all the reasons that are opposite of the reason your spouse has set their love on you, or your friend has set their love on you, or your co-workers have set their love on you, there is absolutely zero posturing in this relationship. No makeup. None. You roll out of bed looking a hot mess. No foundation, no blush, no eyeliner, no long eyelashes, nothing. No YouTube videos. How do I do it? Nothing. No first impression. Go on my first date. Doesn't matter if you don't have a six pack. I've never had to worry about that. But doesn't matter if you don't have one. No failure is what it means. You roll out of bed in your nastiness. Hair looks like a rat's nest. If anybody saw your face, they wouldn't recognize you from, from a picture on Facebook. Doesn't matter. God knows you. He knows you. He's always known you. Always known you. Doesn't matter. None of that. No putting your best foot forward. No, I'll show them this, but I'm not showing them that. If they ever found this about me, they would not love me anymore. Not with God. Not with God. You can't look at how good you are and say, that's why God loves me. And you can't look at how bad you are and say, that's why he doesn't love me. Because that's not how God loves. God's love does not depend on how good or how bad you are. It depends on him feeling like it. And he always does. Every day he says, I feel like loving them today. God, why do you love me? I'm such a sinner because I feel like it. God, you love me because I come to church and take communion? Pfft, no, because I feel like it. It's from God because he loves you. It is because God loves you 
that he set his love on you and chose you. And it gets better. And is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. That's why he loves you and chose you. It's because God made a promise to someone that he would love and sustain their ancestors. A promise was Abraham to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so when you get to Israel in Deuteronomy, while before they enter in the land of promise, God reminds these people who are descendants of Abraham, this is why I love you. I promised I would, and I feel like it. You see how it's all God-centered? I want to do it, and I promised I'd do it. Not like our love. When the sex is good, we can love our wives all day long. It's contingent. Not God. Now this relates to you in Christ in this way. The promises that God made to Abraham in the Old Testament all find their fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. Every single one of them. This is how biblical history, right? Bible theology holds together. So he says to Abraham, I'll make you a great nation. Okay. How will he do it ultimately? He will do it in Christ. And we're told how in Galatians chapter 3. So if you want to turn there, 974, 973 actually in your pew Bible. Galatians chapter 3. And this is the way Paul interprets the promise that God made to Abraham and how God fulfills it in the person of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 6. It says that Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, that's us, unless you're Jewish. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. By faith. Preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, tell me if this sounds familiar. In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and to do them. Now, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. That's talking about his death. That's a quotation from Deuteronomy as well. Christ became a curse for us by dying for us. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And he goes on to say in verse 28 of the same chapter, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to the promise. In other words, God made a promise that he would give Abraham, among many things, a great name, a great nation. And Paul points to Christ's death on a cross 
and our faith in that death on a cross as the way God fulfills that promise. By faith, we are sons of Abraham. By faith in Jesus Christ, we, in a sense, become Jewish. That's how we get there. We don't have the record books that says that we are kin to King David genealogically, but we are spiritually by faith in Christ Jesus. So God fulfills his promise to Abraham by giving him Christ Jesus, and he shows his love for us by giving us Christ Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave us Christ Jesus to die on the cross, for while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. The demonstration of God's love for us, Jesus Christ on a cross, is the very way that he kept his word to Abraham. God's love and God's faithfulness are intertwined with one another. One of the most amazing things about God's love is that it's tied to his ability to keep his promises. Which means this. God's love, like our love, is performance-based. But not in the way that we think. It's performance-based Not in that we have to perform in order to get it. It's performance-based in that God has performed in Jesus Christ in order to give it. It's performance-based on his end, not ours. God's faithfulness. His his promise to love us is not rooted, is not planted in the shallow soil of our self-sufficiency or our ability to be faithful. It's planted, rather, in the deep, rich soil of God's faithful, covenant-keeping character so that we can say with Paul, when we are faithless, he is faithful. Which means that God's love for you doesn't end in the way some marriages end. You don't go to the altar with Christ and exchange vows and have a wonderful honeymoon in first 10 or 15 years of marriage and then get divorced. It doesn't end that way. He doesn't move on. He stays. In the midst of it all, in the midst of your adultery, he stays. We cheat on him every day, and he takes us back. We pack our bags and put them by the front door and say, I deserve to be kicked out. And he says, I don't kick my people out. It's unexpected love. So I want to end with this. I want you to think about the week. You can take out a piece of paper if you want. And I'll ask you this question. How does God feel about you this week? If you don't believe that there's a God, just act like there was. If there is a God who is ultimate righteousness and justice, he's true, and he looked at me, how would he feel about me? I want to read you my list. Jeremiah, how does God feel about you this week? Number one, disappointed. I mean, how can he not be? Angry. Distant. 
unconcerned, impatient. That's my list. You know, and I did it after I had pretty much this sermon on love in my head. You know, out of all the way to answer, all the ways you can answer this question biblically, how does God feel about me? The overwhelming evidence and verdict that the Bible gives concerning how he feels about me is that he loves me. And it didn't even make my list. That's why we teach our children, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Because there will come a time in your life where if you didn't believe what the Bible told you, that God loves me, well then you probably just wouldn't believe it. You just wouldn't believe it. And if, and I'm just a person, you know, I stand up here and preach every week, but I'm just a person. I probably got twice as many doubts as you've got. A hundred times as many mistakes as you do. And I just thought to myself, well, good night. If you don't feel like God loves you, then there has to be somebody else that feels the same way. If disappointed is number one on your list, it's got to be in somebody, it's got to be number one in somebody else's list too. If you process how God loves you through the way you love other people, you'll never understand God's love. But if you come to God's word, as humbly as you can and with as few preconceived notions about love and the way the world works as you can, then like Paul, we can begin to understand with each other what is the height and depth and the breadth and width to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that we might be filled with the fullness of God. And what I can tell you as Christians about the love of God is this. God's love for you in Christ has nothing to do with your unrighteousness, but it has everything to do with Christ's righteousness. In Christ, he will not put you out. In Christ, he will not reject you. In Christ, he will receive you. Because Christ has taken every sin that makes you put down a list like I have. He's taken every one of those sins on himself, and he's given us the opposite of this list. So in Christ Jesus, here's how God feels about me this week. He is proud of me, happy with me, close to me, concerned with me, long-suffering with me. He loves me, not because of me, but because I'm in someone who's worthy, if you want to think about it from an earthly perspective, of all the things that we say we're not worthy of. Christ is worthy of those things. And you are in Christ. And guess what? That makes you in Christ worthy of God's love. And so my prayer today is that whether you're in Christ or not, that you will receive it. That you will receive a love that is unlike any love that you've ever received. Because when you receive this kind of love, it changes the way you love other people. It's the only way to really love someone else is to receive the love that God has for us and to let him teach us what it means to love like he loves. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your compassion. Help us in our weakness when we feel downtrodden like you've given up on us. Point us to Christ. Point us to the cross. 
May our hope be in Him and Him alone. Lord, I pray for those who don't believe in You, don't believe in Your love, that You, through the power of the Spirit, will just cut through the callousness that's on our hearts. So much of it, not even our own fault. We don't know what it's like to be loved. We never had anybody love us. We don't know know what it's like to trust other people. We don't know what it's like to serve other people. The people that say they love us act the opposite of the way you act towards us and you say that you love us. So help us to see that the way you define love is the way that we should define it. The way that you love is the way we should strive to love. And I pray that you would grant us grace to receive the outpouring of love that comes from your spirit that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grant grant belief to the unbelief. And for those of us who are in Christ, may we be strengthened by the spirit in our inner person so that we may know what is the height and breadth and depth and width to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled with your fullness. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Help us to receive it and to walk in it and to believe it. In Christ's name we pray, amen.